Well, let's turn to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together as your people to hear your word to us. Help us to be humble enough to receive your word. Open up our minds, open up our ears, open up our hearts so that we might know how much you love us, how much you care for us, Lord, that you tell us that we are your people and that you have come to save us. We thank you for your grace. We ask that you would be with us now in this time. Pray these things in the name of Christ, who is our living Savior. Amen. Well, this is the third week of Advent, and we are going through a series called Feeling the Weight. Feeling the weight, the heaviness that we experience as we wait. The first week we looked at um, the Israelites' uh, lack of faithfulness in their waiting, where they make this idol uh, a golden calf and they begin to worship it. Last week, Pastor Rich looked at um, the story of Saul, who jumps the gun in his fear and he offers a sacrifice um, when he's not supposed to, another um, showing of disobedience. Well, this week and next week, we're going to look at um, two instances of people who were faithful in the waiting. It wasn't any easier for them, but they displayed a trust in the Lord. The Lord moved and worked in them um, to wait obediently. So as we go through these times of waiting, times of waiting uh, for loved ones to return to the Lord, times of uh, illness, times where we're caring for our loved ones who are sick. As we're in these times of waiting, we turn to the Lord and we hear from the prophet Habakkuk and what the Lord has to say to us through him. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the prophet Habakkuk. Chapter 3, we're going to be looking at all of chapter 3. Well, this is the last chapter from the book. Habakkuk receives a vision of the Lord. And we'll notice different parts um, uh, as we read. So the first part, and I'll kind of narrate this as we go through, but he requests something of the Lord. He uh, tells a vision of the Lord's coming. He gives a description of what he sees as the Lord does battle. And then he has a response to the vision. So people of God, hear God's word to us in the prophet Habakkuk, starting in verse three, or chapter 3, uh, verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. And this is his request now, his prayer. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. This is the vision that Habakkuk reports of the Lord's coming. He says, God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunshine, the sunrise, rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed, but he marches on forever. I saw the tents of Kashan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Now this is Habakkuk's description of what he sees as the Lord goes to battle. Verse 8, Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people. To save your anointed one, you crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head. 
when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. And now this is Habakkuk's response to the vision. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Question for you. Do you really trust, do you really believe that the Lord knows what he's doing? As you read, as you watch the news about everything that's going on in the world, as you look at your own life, things that have happened in the past, things that are currently happening now, things that are happening or have happened to those that are closest to you, do you really trust that the Lord knows what he's doing? Well, let's look at the uh, conclusion to the book of Habakkuk. Let's read that again. Though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, And the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Well, this is the end of the book. This is the conclusion. These are words of confidence and words of trust in the Lord, no matter how desperate the situation. Even when their main crop, even when their cattle, their livestock, these sources of food and income, even when these are taken away and life is painted as barren and bleak, yet, yet I will trust I will rejoice in the Lord. Well, this is where the prophet Habakkuk ends. This is the, uh, the last part of the book. But this is not where he begins. Now, as we read earlier in our time of, uh, time of lament, the prophet Habakkuk, he starts at a place of lament, of crying out to the Lord. How long, O Lord, will you make me wait? How long, O Lord, will you make me look at this injustice? How long will it seem like you are not there? How long will we have to put up with all of this wrongdoing? Well, like the prophet Habakkuk, we often lament. We often cry out to the Lord, How long? How long, O Lord, when we see these injustices happening in the world? How long, O Lord, will people be detained at the U.S.-Mexico border? How long will children be separated from their families? How long will violence and poverty in places like Central America, places like the Middle East, parts of Africa, how long will these situations drive families from their homes? forcing them to journey thousands of dangerous kilometers, all in the hopes of finding a safe place to live. How long, O Lord, we cry out, will people in Edmonton have to live on the cold winter streets? How long, O Lord, will young women and young men in Edmonton be tricked or forced into sex trafficking? How long, O Lord, will this gap between the rich and the poor continue to grow? How long, O Lord, will our economy continue to struggle? How long will people be without work? We look at the injustices in the world, and like Habakkuk, we cry out. 
we lament to a God that seems sometimes like he's not there or like he's not listening. But God, what God does for Habakkuk, as God does for His people down through the centuries, is God appears. God reveals Himself. This morning we're going to use the word theophany. Have you ever heard of the word theophany? Yeah, some of us shaking our heads. Well, theophany comes from this word theo meaning God and phinane meaning appear. So God appears. This word theophany means that God reveals himself to human beings. We look back at the Old Testament at some pretty famous instances of God revealing himself. We think about Moses. Early on in the Exodus story, the Lord comes to Moses and reveals himself in the fire of a burning bush. We think about Moses where the Lord leads the people to Mount Sinai and then he descends on this mountain in thunderclouds and flashing lightning and in fire. The Lord again reveals himself to Moses, another theophany. We think about Isaiah in his commissioning, Isaiah chapter 6, where the Lord gives Isaiah the prophet this vision of the Lord Almighty seated on his throne. And now what the Lord is doing, he is appearing to Habakkuk. The Lord is coming to Habakkuk in a vision. And this, this is what turns his perspective. This is what leads Habakkuk from this place of lament, even this place of skepticism. And he's led into a place of trust. He's led into a place of confidence and not just trust, but he's turned to worship. He is turned to rejoicing in the Lord God, his Savior. So let's look at this theophany, God's appearing to the prophet. What do we notice about it? Well, first, what we notice, and probably most importantly, is that God is there. God is there. In the midst of the suffering, in the midst of all the injustice, when it seems like God is not paying attention, when it seems like God has removed himself, God comes to Habakkuk in this vision and essentially says, I am here. And what do we know about this God who appears? We know that this is the God of the covenant. There's continuity uh, that is being drawn out here in Habakkuk's vision. It says that God comes from Mount Paran. He comes from Taman. Well, Mount Paran is this, this mountain down by Mount Sinai. And if we know Mount Sinai, this is where the Lord brings the people. He brings the Hebrews here. After he frees them from slavery in Egypt, they meet him at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, this is where the Lord takes his people and he says, out of all the nations on the earth, out of all the people, you are my treasured possession. You are my people. In this vision, God is saying, I am the same God. I am the God who freed your ancestors from slavery in Egypt. And now I'm going to be present with you in your trouble in Jerusalem. This is the God of the covenant. This is a God who's here. He's the God of the covenant. And he is a powerful God. In this vision, when it talks about God's appearing, it says that he comes as bright as the sunrise. He comes with his entourage and with his envoy. Going ahead of him and behind him are plague and pestilence. Mountains are trembling at his appearing. The earth is quaking when the Lord comes. So first, we know that God is there. Well, second, what we see is that God is coming to do battle. God is depicted as a warrior in these verses. God is depicted as somebody who comes with weapons drawn out. His bow's not concealed, it's not hidden. He has a bow in his hand, he has arrows in his hand. In his other hand, he has a spear that he operates with quickness and with precision. The Lord is not indifferent. This is not somebody who is limited in their control and in their power. This is a warrior who has come to do battle. And he has come to do battle and do away with all of the wickedness and all of the evil that he sees before him. 
Now, the third thing that we see is that God comes on behalf of his people. God comes on behalf of Israel. Habakkuk says, you came to deliver your people, Lord. This same God who delivers and sets the people free from Egypt is the same God who is coming to them now in their time of trouble and in their time of despair. This is the God who's coming. This is the God who has revealed himself in this vision and in this theophany. And this does something to Habakkuk. This does something physically to the prophet. We read that his heart pounds inside of his chest. We read that his lips are quivering, almost like a child who's just experienced a bout of wailing. Habakkuk's legs are trembling underneath him. It says that his, in his bones he's experiencing decay. When the Lord appears to Habakkuk, when the Lord comes, something happens inside of him. He experiences, he feels the awe and the fear of the Lord. And this, in turn, is what shapes Habakkuk, what changes his perspective and leads him from a place of lament into a place of trust, into a place of confidence, into a place of worship, and ultimately leads him into a place of joy. Well, this theophany, this appearing, has changed Habakkuk's perspective. And a theophany has changed our perspective too. But our experience of a theophany is unlike anything anyone else has experienced. Because God comes to us. God appears to us in the person of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is the ultimate theophany. But Jesus Christ, God the Son, is the image of the invisible God coming to live among us, coming to dwell with us. But notice how this God comes. He doesn't come in power. He doesn't come with guns blazing, weapons drawn. He doesn't come in thunderclouds with flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder, and fire. No, he doesn't come in power. He comes in humility. Jesus Christ comes in humility, born as a baby under the starry Bethlehem sky. He's not born to royalty. He's born to a young, unsuspecting virgin and her husband. And this trend of downward humility continues because this baby grows up to be a servant. He tends to the poor. He eats with tax collectors and those that are outcast by society. But Jesus Christ, he comes and he heals the sick. He touches lepers, those with skin diseases. Well, Jesus Christ, he serves his disciples. He washes their feet. These are the same disciples who are about to turn on him. Well, in short, Jesus does justice. Jesus does mercy. Well, if you've been keeping track with our congregational readings, we've been talking about justice. We've been looking at justice from God's perspective. And what is justice according to God? It is dignity, it is respect, and it is fair treatment for all people. Because all people have been created in God's image. All people have value and are worthy because God has created them. Well, justice is punishment for wickedness. It is punishment for wicked deeds, but God advances those who are on the margins. God ultimately, in our scripture readings, is concerned with really four groups of people. He is concerned with immigrants. He is concerned with orphans. He is concerned with widows. And he is concerned with those living in poverty. This is justice according to our God. And this is what Jesus Christ comes and he does as he lives among us. Jesus Christ comes to the needy people. He comes to us. We are needy. 
in our greatest need, Jesus Christ comes to us. Jesus Christ comes to us in this trajectory of downward humility is completed as he goes to the cross. Jesus Christ gives up his life willingly on the cross for the sins of his people, for our sins, for these sins that we've committed, these injustices that we've done, these transgressions that we've committed against the Lord himself that have separated us from him, that have separated us from each other. Jesus Christ comes and he pays the ultimate sacrifice for those. But don't, don't get this God wrong. Don't think that he is a weak God. Don't think that he is an indifferent God. Don't think that this is a God with limited control because this God is raised from the dead. This God ascends into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father now at the place of highest authority. And Jesus Christ has promised that he is going to come again. And he promises that when he comes again, he is going to come back ready to do battle. He is going to come back as a warrior, ready to fight on behalf of the oppressed and imprisoned immigrant. He is ready to fight. He is going to come back on behalf of the abused child. He is going to come back and fight against systems of social and economic injustice that are keeping the poor weighed down in their place. Jesus Christ is going to come back. He has promised to set everything right, to do justice and to do mercy. Well, this is the theophany that we've experienced. Jesus Christ coming to us. This is the theophany that has grabbed us. It's taken us and it's met us in our place of despair. It's met us in our doubts. It meets us in our skepticism. It meets us in all of our hopelessness. And what it does is it turns us to the Lord. It leads us into a place of trust. It leads us into a place of worship. Ultimately, it opens us up to joy, knowing that God has come, knowing that God is still here operating in power, knowing that he promises to redeem and restore everything he has created. And as we wait, as we feel the heaviness of this season, we are able to wait in confidence and in trust As we live these lives before us, we live as Christ lived. We live in humility. We live humble lives. We take the initiative going to those on the streets. We greet them with a smile. We greet them with respect. We listen to them and we hear their voices. We allow their voices and their stories to impact our lives. These are not charity cases. These are people that have been created in God's image, people who have value, people who are worthy, people who deserve respect. And we amplify these voices. We're essentially putting a microphone up in front of them so that we can hear their plight. We become advocates of the oppressed, even when it means that our reputation and our resources are at stake. Well, as God's people living here humbly now, we pray. We pray on behalf of the vulnerable. We pray for those who are living on the streets. We pray for the widows. We pray for those who are single parents, having to work, having to care for their children. We pray for those who are in abusive relationships. We pray for the vulnerable the vulnerable immigrants, the newcomers to Canada who are having trouble getting settled in. We are people of prayer. We pray out to our God who is a God of justice and who is a God of mercy. And as we wait, as we wait in this time, we turn to our God who has come to us. We look forward to the hope of his coming again. And as we wait, we wait with confident trust knowing that this God is faithful, that he lives in us now, that he's working out his purposes for the good of his people and for the good of this creation. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.